We've made a cider. We've made a sicer. Now it's time to make wine. Spiced apple wine. Right, so what's the difference between cider and wine? Just a name. Usually wine is higher ABV. What's the exact cutoff? Eh, I don't know. Ask the legal people, they'll probably tell you something around 8%. Above that makes it wine, below that makes it cider. Does it really matter? No, because technically everything we make is a country wine or a home style wine or whatever. And you know what? It's all good at the end of the day, as long as you like it, doesn't really matter what you call it. But for today, we are calling this spiced apple wine because otherwise, how would you find it on YouTube? <laughs> so to make this, you're going to need a gallon, well, to make our size batch, you need a gallon of apple juice. Now, when you get your apple juice, make sure it has the least ingredients possible and make sure none of them end in eight or eight. Ascorbic acid is totally fine. Citric acid is totally fine. From concentrate is totally fine. But ours literally says, ingredients, apple juice. This is Costco brand, Kirkland stuff. I saw that and went, yeah, we need to just use that because it's, it's just perfect. This is one gallon. We're also going to be using Red Star Premier Classique yeast today. Why? Well, because we have some of it and it goes to a 15% and it is made to do a robust dry wine with strong flavors. So I'm thinking this applies. Also, we're going to use some spices. I have here one cinnamon stick. It looks to be about two inches long. Eight allspice berries. There's a name for them, Jamaican something, if you don't know what an allspice is, and one whole clove. Now, last time I did this, somebody said a clove of what? It's a clove. It's the spice, the clove. Very strong smelling. They smell nice though. These things will overpower your brew if you are not careful. So we are going to monitor this. They also can slow down fermentation. Don't worry, we got you covered. We're gonna be using some Fermade O and this is gonna have a strong yeast, lots of sugars. I'm not worried about it. I want this to work from primary. Can you add all those spices in conditioning or secondary phase if you wish to? Absolutely. Absolutely. I will not stop you. So speaking of sugars, the first thing we need to do is to find out just how much sugar rich our juice is. Yep. Most juices run anywhere from 1.050 to about 1.055. I just want to know what ours is. That way I can calculate it because I do actually have a target gravity in mind for this because I know 15% is the maximum of our yeast. I don't want to surpass that. I want to stay a little bit below it. So I know like 1.110 is my absolute maximum starting gravity. So I need to be below that or at that. So we're just going to take a sample of the juice as it is. It smells good. It smells very fresh. Now, as usual, all of our utensils have been sanitized in the red bucket of sanitization. I thought she was going to try to make me say it. I think she's given up on that. It always helps to have like 16 hands to do this. <laughs> you know, and really, you know, takes a village. Get it lower in there so, well, we can aerate. It's okay. Aeration is a good thing in the beginning. There we go. Get some air in there. Okay, I do have quite a bit of a foamy mess here. But it does here to be 1.05, I'm, I'm reading top and bottom just to get the best number possible. 1.054 is my juice. So I'm just gonna write that on the thing here. So if I wanna get 1.110 as my original gravity, what I need to do is take 1.110 minus 1.054, that leaves me with 56 points. Now if I know that regular white sugar, which is what I'm gonna use to, to add sugar to this, is about 46 points, I divide that by 0.046, and I get 1.217. So I'm gonna call that 1.2 pounds of sugar, which comes to um, 545 grams of sugar. So let me take a note on that, 1.2 pounds. Could you use brown sugar if you want to? Sure. Could you use honey if you want to? Sure, you're gonna need more. Brown sugar is going to alter the flavors, okay? Not necessarily in a great way. Molasses, when it ferments, tastes exactly like the word split into two. <laughs> I'll let you use your imagination on that one until it ages for a long time. This is meant to be drank sooner rather than later. We are going to age some of it, but it is actually meant to be drank young. So now what I want to do, get some juice into here and spill it all over the place apparently. It's okay. My arm caught it. Okay. I went about halfway for a very good reason. We're going to add our sugar and some of that sugar is going to displace some of the amount of volume we get from the juice and it's easier to mix it up. 
And we now have a wet funnel, so that sugar is going to stick to our funnel. <laughs> so this way we can rinse it out. Yeah, because I didn't think about that. So let's get the scale. We could use a piece of paper and do the funnel thing that way if you wanted to. We're, we're going to show you the hard way, just because it's what we do. I was saying, if you're not having fun at what you're doing, you should be doing something else. So I like to just make things silly, and every once in a while it's funny. Pounds and ounces, that's what we need. No, I need pounds, 1.2 pounds, because I didn't do it as ounces. Ah, yes. See, it's important to know the modes of your scale. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's add the sugar. This is just plain old white sugar, nothing fancy. You can use fancy stuff if you really want to. I'm just not. What the sugar does is it's going to raise the gravity, which means it's going to raise the potential alcohol. If we didn't add sugar, it'd be a perfectly fine product. It just would be much lower in alcohol. Houston, we have a problem. So as you can probably see, that's the top of the sugar. It didn't, <laughs> it didn't go in at all. And, you know, I said I wanted to make this interesting. What happens is the sugar kind of gets caked. This isn't working. Uh-oh. There we go. It's just like a blockage at the bottom, you know? Blockage, never a good thing. Always make sure to prevent blockages, folks. But you see, we make those mistakes so you don't have to. All right, at this point, I'm gonna actually pour in our Fermaid O, which I put in just a tiny bit of water. It might affect the gravity reading ever so slightly, but probably not. Because the amount of water, well, the amount of juice that I put in here actually is gonna affect it much more than anything else. But this didn't mix up well. This is two grams of Fermaid O. Um, for this size batch, that's about appropriate because I'm going with a slightly marginally higher gravity here. I went with two grams. Usually I do 1.5 grams, um, but today I'm doing two and uh, it's just a little bit of water and I'm using the uh, the whisk of unusually whisk of unusually small size, also known as the wuss. And I'm just going to try to rinse off some of that sugar badly. No, nothing even really came out, but it's okay. It's okay, we have the rest of the juice. Yeah, but I have to mix this up. Eh, I'll just pour some more juice in there. It's all good. Just do Yeah, I know, little... just do like the rim. Yeah. Just the rim. It's good for now. I can sit there. Okay. Now, I want to make sure that sugar gets mixed in properly. So, I need my thumb saver bun. It's back here somewhere. It's under this guy. It's in Mozart. And now it's sanitized. And you just want to cap it off so you can shake it up, that's all. And this is known as shaking the bejesus out of it. I want to make sure there's no more of Jesus in there. Actually, I'm just mixing it really good, but I'm also oxygenating this. And the reason you oxygenate in the beginning, this is another confusing point for people. You oxygenate the beginning of a brew, but not once it's making alcohol. So in the very beginning, your yeast are not really making alcohol. What they're actually doing is reproducing like crazy. They're just having a party going, hey guys, we found some sugar, let's procreate. That's pretty much what they're doing. And once that colony is made, then after all the oxygen is used up, they start to chow down on the yeast. Oh, no. Yeah. The yeast starts to chow down on the sugar and they start to produce alcohol and CO2 as well as about a billion other byproducts. So. In the beginning, you want oxygen. It builds a stronger colony. Keeps off flavors and weird smells like that sulfury rotten egg smell. That's caused by not enough of this in the beginning. So shake your brew. I have all these like one-liner things. Thwack your packet, shake your brew. Time heals all brews. Notice the color change. That's the addition of oxygen. I think that sugar is mixed in quite well. So what I can do now is we're going to add in the rest of our juice. I'm going to try to rinse off the, uh, the funnel a little bit more. We're going to reach the danger zone soon, which is where 
you say, how much more brew do I want versus how much risk do I want to have of it erupting? Of course, we have the dreaded foam. That's the bejesus foam. <laughs> Leaves a little warning behind you. Now that foam will dissipate and a different kind of foam will actually come up. The different foam that comes up is actually created from the yeast themselves. This is just air mixed in with the, the juice. It's just foam. I don't think this is really gonna work. I just wanted to do something. <laughs> Still this much juice left. It's full that far. You know what? I'm calling it good. You know why? You can drink that, it's not wasted. And having a little bit of extra headspace on something like this is probably gonna be a good thing because this has a strong potential to really be a very vigorous fermentation. So let's get that out of there. I would like to take another reading on it though. I need to mix it first. So I'm gonna take a reading. There is a potential that this has exceeded my 1.110 because of volume. If that's the case, we will deal with that when the time comes. Again, showing all the things that can go wrong so you don't have to worry about it and you know what, how to deal with it. That's half of brewing is problem solving. Being able to figure out, okay, this happened, why? And what can I do to prevent it? And even more so, what can I do to fix it? And it's totally okay to do what I'm doing right now because it's aeration, there's, there's no harm. So let's see, what do we got? Oh, well, what do you know? 1.108. <laughs> it's exactly where I want it to be, so let me take a note on that. So, what does that mean? It means that I hit my target gravity, it means that if I add more juice, I'll probably reduce that gravity because the sugar has more density than the juice does. So I really don't want to do that right now. I'm happy with the volume. That's fine, we'll probably end up with four nice bottles of wine out of this. And now it's time to start adding the other things. So the other things are our spices. One cinnamon stick, approximately two inches in length. Whole thing, right in. One clove, as mentioned earlier. Resist the urge to add more, okay? It can be very overpowering. This is gonna sit in here for probably a couple weeks, so we don't wanna overdo it. And then I did eight allspice berries. I like allspice, it reminds me of Christmas. If you've watched our channel for a while, you might recognize these as the same spices that I used in my spiced methaglen mead. And yeah, that's the idea. Um, every once in a while, somebody will say, hey, how come you don't make more wines? Because wine and cider is cheaper for me than it is to get all the honey. I agree. So this is kind of like, think of it as the budget-friendly version of my spiced methaglen in apple wine form. So it's not gonna taste the same, but these are kind of like apple pie flavors, so goes with apple really nice. It was Derek's idea to make this. So she wanted an apple wine, and I said, how about a spiced apple wine? So it was, you know, the banging of our two heads together and coming out the other side. <laughs> so the only thing that's left to add is our yeast. Red Star. <laughs> make terrible packets. See, they're terrible because they're not terrible. Get it? I shouldn't have to get another implement of destruction to open a packet of yeast. And I know they've seen at least one of our videos by now. I mean, <laughs> well, that sounded really arrogant, yeah. but maybe they've seen maybe, at least one of hopefully. our videos by now. Maybe someone has pointed it out to <laughs> someone who works at Red Star by this point. I mean, is it that hard to do? You know, just make them terrible. I understand that it's a foil thing and all that, but paper would work really well too. It wicks away moisture and doesn't let the mold. So, you know, everybody else does it in paper packets. Just saying. Okay, got them to the bottom, so make sure to thwack your packet. See, there's another one of those three word lines. And it's not even a joke, really, because a lot of it does stick to the inside and you want to get it all out. Now, there's I've, a static buildup and stuff and those little particles just want to yeah. stay in there. Now, I've made a mess. I have yeast all over the sides. I'm going to give this a quick little stir around. I, not really a full mix, just a little like bounce it around a bit to see if I can get some of it off there. And hey, looks like I did a pretty good job this time. All right, so. There's one thing left to do. And what's that? We need an airlock. Yes, we do. Airlock and stopper, critical things for fermentation. You just wanna make sure that it's on there pretty securely and stick it in there. Make sure both ends are dry and it stays in nicely. If you can't get it to stay, a little rubber band over the top works just fine. Why do we use an airlock? Because fermentation creates gases. Those gases need to escape, because if they don't escape, kablooey! Also, 
not just letting gas escape, it's preventing things from getting in, like bugs. Literal bugs, fruit flies. They will love this stuff because it's fruit, okay? And sugars, and they're attracted to it. Also, bacteria, airborne pathogens, things like that that you don't want getting in there. You want to have a, uh, a stoppage system between them and your brew. This is very important. Don't just put plain water in your airlock. We use sanitizer fluid, which means we used star sand mixed according to the manufacturer's directions and just put some of that fluid into here. You can also use vodka, cheap whiskey. I mean, I would, you can use good whiskey if you really want to, but what's the point of that? You can use any kind of high alcohol spirits. I would say something more than 30% alcohol is going to be sufficiently dangerous for that bug because an insect can get through water. They're not gonna get through that sanitizer fluid so easily and they're certainly not going to get through any kind of a, uh, a distilled spirit. Please don't do, use something like isopropyl alcohol because that is toxic to human consumption. So yeah. if something occurs and you have a backwards flow and some of that liquid gets into your brew, that then liquid will get into you and we don't want you to get sick. Yes. So don't put anything in there that's toxic to you, which technically all alcohol is toxic. But we're not getting into that. So. Um, Speaking of the whole backflow thing, people have asked a lot about star sand, if it backflowed in. There's only like an ounce or two here. I've read on this, looked it up, the manufacturer's suggestions, all that. If you mixed it according to their suggestions, you can drink this stuff and it's not dangerous. I don't recommend it. I don't think I would want to do that. But supposedly it's a low enough um, acid that it won't harm you. So if you can drink several ounces, this little tiny bit in a whole gallon, not gonna be a problem. It's also intended to be used as a no rinse product. So that means there is residual star sand in everything yeah. that you've sanitized. Yeah, just a little bit. And it's supposedly totally safe. I'm just quoting the manufacturer. I don't actually know because I am not actually a scientist and have not actually tested those exact things. Now, since this is a first time brew for us, we don't know for certain what's gonna happen, but we have a good idea because we have made wine before, we have made spice wine before, and we have made apple products before, so. Yeah, our first apple cider video, we called it apple cider, it was actually apple wine. We're not overly concerned that this fermentation may go crazy. However, if- Oh, it's gonna. <laughs> if, if you are, or if you're unsure, the best way to deal with that is to put your newly created fermentation on a baking tray that has edges. That way, if the yeast gets super happy and push that foam up and out, it'll go into the tray rather than all over your house. Also, if that does happen, first step is take the airlock off, clean it out, replace the fluid, put it back in. If it happens again, well, now you might want to look into a blow-off tube. We just happen to have a video on airlocks and blow-off tubes explaining all that. But before you leave, don't leave. You didn't leave yet, did you? Are you still here? We want to show you what this is looking like once it starts fermenting. So we'll be back as soon as it kicks up. So it's been like two hours and look what we got. <laughs> it's going. The foam got pushed up into the airlock a little bit. So we'll clean that out, replace it. I don't think it's going to be much of a problem. Um, it's, it's working. This is exactly what you want to see. You will see some foam in here sometimes. And if you don't see foam, that's okay too. It just means that it's creating bubbles and sometimes the bubbles stack. Other You'll probably see little tiny bubbles floating around the, the side and making a little layer. You might see some sediment on the bottom. All of those things are completely normal in a fermentation. Absolutely. So this will probably take, oh geez, this is the spiced apple wine. This is like 1.108 starting. Yeah, this will be a couple of weeks to ferment out and we'll be back with an update at that time. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching and have a great day. Bye bye. All right. So this was started on April 21st, 2022. Today is May 9th, 2022. If you happen to be watching this in 2023 or 2024, don't think that you can't make this anyway, because you know, hey, a good recipe is still a good recipe. But that means this has about 18 days on it. So it's just three days shy of three weeks old. And it started at 1.108 specific gravity, which is normal for us. It's in the it's in the good range. Usually these things are done by now, but this one stayed relatively cloudy and I wanted to give it a little bit more time. But we're gonna take its first reading and see how it's doing. So all of our tools have been sanitized as usual. Yep, that's why they're dripping on me. And what we're gonna use is a hydrometer, graduated cylinder. Now we're using a 100 mil cylinder because I used to have the 250 and it was just huge and it took a lot more sample to get it to work. Also our syringe is a 100 mil syringe, so. That works out. 
When pulling a sample like this, try to go carefully because it is going to be gassy. Um, we have not degassed this really. So there's a lot of foam and it makes the readings harder to do. And then I put it all the way in the bottom so that I don't spit any air in there and just fill it up. And if you invert it like Brian is, then any foam that you may have captured will go to the top. So hopefully, if you're careful, it won't go into your graduating cylinder. We're gonna take a little sample. Probably a little more than that. <laughs> but let's get a reading on this first. See where it's at. I'm expecting it to have gone dry. Um, well, that's a little bit surprising. 1.004. Now, it's possible that it's stalled. It's possible it's not done. It's also possible that the spices that are in here are just preventing it from going any further, which is technically a stall, but four points, I'm really not going to get concerned over it. So let me take a note. Today is May 9th, 2022. 1.004. However, I'm not going to rack this yet because that breaks the rule. We want to make sure it's really done and stable before we rack it. Eh, just got a little sample. And I'm going to pour this back in. I'm going to be very, very careful about it. We don't want to introduce more oxygen, but you don't have to go crazy about it as long as you're relatively careful. If you feel uncomfortable doing this at this stage, we completely understand and you don't have to do this. Absolutely. Just drink it. Someone asked a question uh, recently. Is it dangerous to drink a brew before it's done fermenting, like to get the active yeast into you. Dangerous? Probably not. Worst case, it'll cause you some digestional distress, you might say. Uh, could be very minor to relatively uncomfortable for a day or so, but it's not permanent damage. It's not even really harmful. Um, so no, it's really not dangerous to do. It just might cause you some uh, discomfort for a few hours or a day. Yeah, this is relatively cloudy. I'm going to let you take the do you want to take the first taste? Sure. It's a lady's first kind of thing, but usually if they're really, really young and sometimes they're nasty, I don't like to do that to her. We're not going to say anything. Nope, not giving a thing away. Okay, so this is going to go back onto the uh, fermentation station. Give it another week, see if that comes down any. We'll be back with it then. It's been another week. It's time to take another reading to make sure this is really done. To take a reading, I just use graduated cylinder with a hydrometer, and then I have to have a sampling device of some sort, and that just happens to be a big syringe with a piece of tubing. But, you know, turkey baster works really well. Resist the urge to try pouring it, because it'll just, it, no, just don't do it. It's it, it, bad. Very gassy, as to be expected, you know, it's, just finished fermentation, so we have all these gases still in there. This one, I don't think is gonna clear. We actually waited a while to take readings on it because it wasn't clearing, but I don't think it's ever really gonna. Does that bother me? Not really. Okay, so last time we checked it, it was at 1.004. Let's see where it is today. It looks like 1.002. If I really had to be pushed, I'd say 1.003. It's just between the two lines. So, you know what? I'm gonna call this one done. But 1.002. Okay, let's do a quick ABV test here. I'm, I'm gonna do this with one hand. I reached for the calculator the teachers told me I would never have within arm's reach that is always within arm's reach, pretty much 24 hours a day. Yeah, so here we go. Open up the calculator. And it's 1.108 was our starting gravity, minus 1.002 is our ending gravity. I use 135 as my coefficient. Many people use 131.25, I know that. The 135 is actually more accurate when you get up to higher ABV volumes, like anything over like say eight to 10%. Um, we did a video on that though, so we can link you to that. That way I don't have to spend this video explaining it. And oh, times 135, equals 14.31%. And what yeast did we use? This is Premier Classique. I think that's like a 15% yeast. So yeah, I mean, it's dry, so we're fine. Um, I don't believe this is going to ferment anymore or not in any noticeable amount. So we're going to rack this and get some of those spices out of there. So um, let me pour this 
into the new fermenter that we're going to be using, and we'll get all that set up. Be back with you in just a second. 